Okay, I'd like to uh, start with an apology, which is that some of you have uh, commented on the shortcomings of journal editors. I'm a journal editor. Uh, <laughs> for basic and applied social psychology. So um, blame me for everything. Um, the second thing I'd like to mention is that the thrust of most of the talks yesterday and today has been on what researchers do wrong or dishonestly or questionable research practices and so on. That I don't approve of those things, obviously. So I'll just say don't do them. <laughs> uh, but that's not where I'm going. I, I'm going to make an argument that we would have a lot of problems even if everyone were perfectly honest. Okay, so let's, let's first talk about the typical way people think about reproducibility. And the typical way, of course, is that uh, someone gets uh, statistical significance in an original study, and then they get in a replication study in the same direction. And ah, that's a successful replication. Um, those of you who know me know that I'd like to get uh, significance testing out of social psychology completely. Um, but that's not what I'm going to talk about, okay? Um, that, that, that's a completely different talk that would take much longer than 20 minutes. Um, instead, I want to focus on an implication, which is that large population effect sizes are good. Why? Well, the larger the population effect size, the better your chances are of getting P is less than 0.05 in the original study, and P is less than 0.05 in the replication study, right? If you have a small effect size, you're likely out of luck. Mm -hmm. uh, small large numbers. Well, you get a correct, that's more correct P now. No, no, let, let's, not a, let's not confuse effect size with sample size. Oh, sorry. Did I say sample size? I meant oh, a. No, you got it right. Okay. Okay. So, um, but I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to, to consider what I like to call the M&M problem, uh, Michelson and Morley. Oh, yeah. Right, so uh, people used to think that the uh, universe was filled with the luminiferous ether. Why did they think that? Because uh, Newton's corpuscle theory had been disconfirmed. Light is a wave, everybody thought. Uh, waves need a medium to travel through, right? Or they can't get from one place to the other, like they can't get to the Earth from the stars. And so the universe must be filled with that. I and mean, it was weird because uh, for other reasons it had to be uh, transparent to ordinary matter but not to light. If, if, but let's not worry about all that. Uh, the, the bottom line is that Michelson Morley uh, performs uh, important research to detect the luminiferous ether and their effect size was near zero. Okay. Now, today, can we replicate the study? Sure, any physicist can do it easily. In fact, I was in email contact with a physicist who actually wants to bring back the luminiferous ether, but that's another issue <laughs> altogether. Um, the, uh, the point being that um, physicists have no trouble replicating it. You know, they will get an effect size near zero. Um, so there's something wrong with defining reproducibility in terms of something that implies that a larger effect size is better than a smaller effect size. It, what we should want is an accurate effect size, right? So let's uh, talk about a better way. And that is if the original and replication studies render sample statistics that are likely to be close to corresponding population parameters. Pretty straightforward, I think, although I've never seen anyone actually suggest that. Um, so there's two issues, right? There is, um, I wish I had, is, do we have a pointer or something? Yes. Yeah, we can have my, yeah, there's a thing. Oh, okay. There. Oh, there's one, okay. Yeah, uh, this thing. Ah. <laughs> well, okay, use my pen. It's safer. I'm going to destroy everything before I'm done. Okay, so um, yeah, so there's there's a precision issue. How close is sufficiently close? 
and there's a uh, confidence or hmm? the one I broke. Okay, here you go. Oh, oh, that's the pointer. Okay. Thank God, someone a lot smarter than me knows how to do this. <laughs> feel like a conductor. So, all right, the strings, I want you to play forte. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> right, so there's a precision issue and there's a probability issue, right? How close do I want to be and what probability do I want to have of being that close? Okay. And I'm going to... Uh, because of thinking in this way, I invented something that I call the a priori procedure, although it took me a couple of papers before I came upon that name. Um, and you'll see why in a minute. It's easier to just give an example than to describe it in the ab abstract, but it features these two issues. So let's go to an example. Um, <coughs> suppose that you're, you want to determine the necessary sample size to uh, um, reach some level of precision that I call F, and at some level of probability, well, this really simple formula will, will give you that, okay? And here's an example. Um, suppose you want to know the sample size needed to have a 95% probability of obtaining a sample mean within one-tenth of a standard deviation of the population mean. So you put 0.1 in here, you put 1.96, which is a z-score that corresponds to 95% there, you run it out and you end up with 385. I always round up because participants don't come in fractions. I'll bet I could make them come in fractions. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, now, quick mathematical note, um, all of these, uh, all APP, equations can be arranged so that if you have any two of sample size, precision, and probability, you can get the third. And that's going to be important. Okay, um, I, I put this slide in because I don't want you to think that we're limited to that one simple thing. Um, in the last two years, we've expanded it so it works for all kinds of things. And one of the things that it works for is skew normality, which we're going to get into a little bit later for reasons that uh, right now won't make any sense, but they will make sense. Okay. I want to switch topics, but I'm going to marry them all in the end, I promise. Um, I want to distinguish between replication in ideal and real universes. Imagine an ideal universe where you can perform a study exactly the same way twice. So that the only difference between the two studies is randomness. Okay. Or we can do the real universe where there's randomness and systematic issues, right? You can't step in the same river twice. Okay, so I think someone mentioned that already. Okay, so... Um, I want to stress that the advantage of thinking in this way is that the uh, probability of replication in the ideal universe is going to be a higher number than in the real universe because there's more that can go wrong in the real universe than in the ideal universe. Okay. Oh, all right, I already said all that. I, I have this terrible habit of going ahead of my slides. Sometimes I wonder why I have them at all. Uh, okay, so so what? That's the question. Why am I making a big deal out of ideal versus real universes? Well, it's difficult to calculate the probability of replication in the real universe because you don't have the information that you need. But it's easy in the ideal universe, right? All you have to do is use an APP equation to get the probability of meeting specifications in the original study and then square it to account for two studies, the original and the replication study. So this is, the, my way is the easy way. And as I said, a value is that although this won't give you the probability in the real universe, it at least will give you an upper limit. 
So if the probability of replication in the ideal universe is a bad number, and it almost always is, as I'll explain in a second, then you know that the probability of replication in the real universe is even worse. Okay, you know, I can't see the screen without, with my glasses on. Okay, um, so as an example, I had a graduate student collect um, a whole bunch of, of journals from five areas of psychology and grab all the articles in a particular year, and then we have used these equations to find out um, you know, how good the precision and hence uh, reproducibility was, and it's lousy, even under ideal conditions in all five areas of psychology. Also, it turned out that the ostensibly most scientific areas, cognitive and neuro, had the worst results. So you see, there is, a, there is an advantage to thinking in this idealized way. Um, now, it, it may, sometimes when I talk about this stuff, people always say, well, David, didn't you just invent another kind of power analysis? We already know about power analysis. You're, you're just doing power analysis. Just in a different way, sure, but still power analysis. Uh, no. Um, here, here's the thing. First, the goal differs. For, for power analysis, as it's usually done, and there are exceptions, but generally um, the idea is to get find out the uh, sample size you need to have a good probability, say 80% of getting P is less than 0.05 at some assumed effect size. The APP doesn't care about that. For the a priori procedure, the idea is to find out the sample size you need in order to meet your specifications for precision and probability. Okay, the math also differs, right, because um, effect size matters for power analysis but not for the a priori procedure, whereas precision matters for the a priori procedure but not for power analysis. Okay. And the, 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 here I'm going to be extreme because it's fun. From an a priori procedure perspective, power analysis actually causes a problem it's supposed to solve, which is not having enough participants. How so, you ask? Well, you didn't ask it, but I'm asking it for you. Uh, okay. Let, let's talk about this graph here. What I did was I assumed various effect sizes along the horizontal axis. I went to a power analysis calculator to find out the number of participants you need to satisfy that. Then I use an appropriate a priori procedure equation to find out uh, the to find out the probability of application along the vertical axis. Right. Um, typically, at least in my area, I don't know about your areas, but in my area, the typical thing to do is assume a medium-sized effect, like 0.5. Find out the number of participants you need to, to meet that, and then you get that, and then you're happy because you think you have an 80% probability of replication. I, I mean, let me be clear. Sorry, change that. You have an 80% probability of getting a P is less than 0.05. Okay. Um, however, you see the probability of replication under that is really bad. And remember, this is an idealized probability of replication, so the real is even worse. Okay, now, obviously, the one sample case is really simple, and no one ever does that, or hardly anybody does that. What about a two-sample case, like a pretest post design or something like that, where you're interested not in the means themselves, but in the difference between means uh, from pretest to post test? Well, same thing. Or maybe you've got, maybe you've got a real, a real true experiment where you randomly assign people to uh, experimental and control conditions, and you're interested in the difference in means across the two conditions, same problem. Okay, so I don't like power analysis very much <laughs> for, for, for obvious reasons. Um, okay, so let's go to sample sizes. Okay, what sample size do you need to have a good probability of replication? Okay, 
Um, so this is sample size along the horizontal axis, uh, probability of replication across the, along the vertical axis. And you see it takes, frankly, a heck of a lot of participants to have a good probability of replication. And if you go to the matched samples case, it's the same problem. And if you go to the independent samples case, it's even more of a problem because this is the sample size per condition. So for the total sample size, you actually have to double these. Okay, makes this all make sense? All right. Um, now, you may be thinking, well, okay, David, you've pointed out a big problem, but how are you going to solve it? And I'm going to give you a solution that won't always work, but it'll work a lot. Or at least I think it will. Um, and it takes advantage of skewness. The thing is, most distributions are skewed, and there are lots of people who have made, done systematic reviews and, and found that. Um, some details, but I'll get them over quickly. Um, there's a family of skew normal distributions of which the family of normal distributions is a subset. And the easiest way to think about it, so that I don't have to try to define everything, um, if you replace the mean with something called the location, the standard deviation with something called the scale, and add a shape parameter, then you go from normal to skew normal. Okay, so it's three parameters, not two parameters. And in the, in the case where you do have normality, the mean and the location are the same, and the standard deviation and the scale are the same. Okay? The key point that I'm going to take advantage of is that skewness is actually friendly. When I was in graduate school, I was taught skewness is terrible. If you have it, get rid of it. Right, do some kind of um, data transformation. But I'm going to make a different argument. So here's a picture. So the, can it, is this pink from where you are? Okay, well, I'll say the pink one is normal, and the colored ones are different kinds of skewed yes. distributions. I'm going to look at you. Okay. <laughs> uh, and you can see that the skew normal ones are taller and narrower which is a good thing, right? Um, and so, I'm, so we're going to take advantage of that. Okay, so um, how can you take advantage of that? Well, consider, consider this graph here where you've got precision along the horizontal axis and sample size along the uh, vertical axis, and the idea is to find the sample size needed for a 90% probability of replication. Why 90%? I picked it out of a hat. I like 90% for some reason. Um, the dotted curve is, uh, is the case where uh, um, the shape parameter is zero, so you have normality, and the solid one is where the sh shape parameter is one, so you have skew normality. Now, why did I pick one? Well, bec oh, thank you. Okay, because uh, with the shape parameter of one, that's not a lot of skewness. In fact, some authorities have even said you can consider it normal. But I want to show that you get a nice advantage even with that small amount. Right? So let's say you want to have really good precision, point one. Look at the difference in the subject count here. Same here for, for match samples, same for independent samples. And again, remember, double everything for independent samples. Okay? So the point I want to make practically, oops, I pressed the wrong button here, sorry, is embrace the skewness. I mean, it's good for you. It's healthy. Have it with your breakfast. Uh, <laughs> okay, so conclusion. What can journals do? Well, the general point is to, uh, one thing journal editors could do, I haven't done it yet because I just made up the stuff, um, <laughs> but one of the things journal editors could do is insist on uh, 
uh, and a APP calculations pertaining to reproducibility. Um, so that's a general point. And a specific point is journal letters could insist on much more attention to distributions and that researchers calculate the appropriate parameter estimate. So if you don't have normality, maybe you shouldn't use the mean, or maybe if you're going to use the mean, you should also use a location. And, and let me be clear, there are, there are distributions other than skew normal as well, and we're developing a priori procedure equations for those as well. And so I'm not trying, I don't want to say always assume skew normality. I just want to say pay attention to your distribution and consider what the appropriate statistics are for that. And that's it. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs>